Luminol is a pretty interesting molecule that displays something called chemiluminescence. This is just a fancy word which means that light is emitted due to a chemical reaction. So when luminol is mixed with an appropriate oxidizer, it will glow a very nice blue color. Although the glow is relatively brief, it's still pretty impressive to see. The final synthesis of the luminol has been a pretty long process to make and I just want to highlight all of the steps that we've taken. To make the luminol, there's two convergent pathways because we have two main precursors. On top, we start with phthalic anhydride, which was extracted from gloves, and we work it through several steps to get it to 3 nitrothalic acid. On the bottom, we start with urea that we got from cold packs in my recrystallization video, and we use this to make something called hydrazine sulfate. Everything that I've mentioned so far has already been done in previous videos, but from this point on, the rest of the synthesis will be done in this video. We will first react 3 nitrothalic acid with hydrazine sulfate to form 3 nitrothal hydrazide. The NO2 group, also known as a nitro group, is then reduced to an NH2 group, and this is our final luminol product. The common name is luminol, but it's also called 3 aminothal hydrazide, so we're going from 3 nitrothal hydrazide to 3 aminothal hydrazide. Just as a side note, besides being fun to play with, Luminol actually has some uses in things like forensics. A luminol solution can be made so that it can be sprayed and when it comes in contact with blood it lights up. This allows investigators to detect traces of blood that they normally wouldn't be able to see. I'm not really going to go and explore its detection of blood in this video, but in the future I do want to. In this video I'll be carrying out two distinct reactions and these are the chemicals that I used. Unfortunately, I messed up and I forgot to put glycerin in this shot, so we're just going to have to pretend that it's there. The first reaction is the longer reaction and it's the synthesis of 3 nitrothal hydrazide. To do this, we use 5 grams of 3 nitrothalic acid that we made in a previous video, 3.5 grams of hydrazine sulfate that we also made in a previous video, and 5 grams of hydrated sodium acetate. I never showed how to make sodium acetate, but this can be easily done by mixing vinegar and baking soda together and then boiling down the mixture and isolating the salt. We'll also need 25 milliliters of glycerin or glycerol and like I said I forgot to put it in this shot. For the second half and the synthesis of the actual luminol, I used 50 milliliters of 10% sodium hydroxide, 45 grams of the super iron out product, and 25 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. The super iron out acts as an over-the-counter source of something called sodium dithionite, and if you have a more pure source, you can use 15 grams of that instead. I started out using a test tube because I thought I could get away with it, but I eventually had to switch. Anyway, 5 grams of 3 nitrothalic acid was added first. Then on top of this, I pour in 3.5 grams of hydrazine sulfate. I'm not sure why I added it in three separate portions, I think I was afraid of missing and spilling it over the edge of the test tube. Then on top of this, I add 5 grams of sodium acetate trihydrate. The order of addition of these powders really doesn't matter. To all these powders, I then poured in 20 milliliters of distilled water. It's important to use distilled water and not tap water. I turned the test tube on the side, and using a metal spatula, I tried to mix it around. A lot of the stuff in there isn't going to be very water soluble, so it's going to be a mixture and a suspension, and not everything will dissolve. Now that I found an excuse to use my heat gun that I bought, I started heating the test tube. The heat gun is pretty much just an industrial hair dryer, and it allows us to heat the test tube without using any flame. As I heated it, the contents started to dissolve, but I got more and more paranoid that the solution would bump, boil, and shoot my contents out of the test tube. So I decided to abandon the dream of using a test tube and a heat gun, and I opted to transfer it to a beaker and heat it just using a hot plate. In retrospect, that's a way better idea, and I'm not even sure why I started with the test tube. Some people might mention that I could use boiling stones in the test tube, and that is true, but I don't have any, so... I set up a small beaker and I transferred the contents of the test tube to it. Of course I had to wash the test tube a little bit with some water to make sure that nothing was left behind. I centered the beaker on the hot plate and removed the clamp and now we can actually get started. With strong stirring, I started heating the mixture. 
As it heated up, it slowly became clearer and clearer as things started to dissolve. When the solution reached boiling, it was semi-clear and it's time to add 25 milliliters of glycerol. Once the glycerol is added, a thermometer is put in place. We now need to heat the reaction to remove all of the water and all of the acetic acid that formed from sodium acetate. As we do this, the temperature should move slowly from 100 degrees to about 120, and then it should spike very quickly to about 200. It's very important to control the temperature because it can easily spike much higher than 200, and if we get it too hot, we'll degrade our product. Once the temperature rises to about 200 C, we want to maintain it between 200 and 220 C for 5 minutes. This is why this reaction must be done with a high boiling point solvent like glycerol, because we need to get such high temperatures. The reaction going on here is not too complicated. The hydrazine sulfate and sodium acetate react to form hydrazine acetate and sodium bisulfate. The formation of the hydrazine acetate allows us to heat the reaction and boil off the acetic acid and therefore create free base hydrazine. Going with this method where the free base hydrazine is produced in the reaction mixture is much safer because hydrazine is pretty toxic and dangerous. This way we can still conduct a reaction that needs free base hydrazine but we don't have to worry about handling it. I'm not going to go over the mechanism in crazy detail but I still do want to cover the main steps. So before the reaction takes place, the first thing that happens is once we hit around 120 C, the acetic acid starts to boil off and our free base hydrazine is liberated. One of the nitrogens of the hydrazine then attacks one of the carbons that is double bonded to an oxygen in the 3 nitrothalic acid. The OH group that's attached to the same carbon ends up being protonated and it's kicked off as water. The other nitrogen in the hydrazine then attacks the other carbonyl group and the same thing happens, the OH is kicked off as water. Once this has all taken place, we're left with our 3 nitrothal hydrazide and 2 water molecules. As we continue with the reaction, the color gets stronger and stronger and we eventually get a very dark red color. For me, I also got some splashing that occurred, but that's okay. I should note that the colors here aren't extremely accurate because the white balance of my camera is a little bit off. After heating it for 5 minutes, we're left with a pretty dark red colored solution. The hot plate was turned off and it was allowed to cool to about 100 C. To the mixture was then added 80 milliliters of water. Our product isn't soluble in water and what we're doing here is we're just trying to wash away the sodium sulfate and the glycerin. The thermometer is also removed and I use a wash bottle to clean it a bit. To separate off the product, it's then vacuum filtered. It could be gravity filtered, but vacuum filtration is just way faster. I pull away most of the liquid, and then I add the beaker washings. I then pull a vacuum again, and I take away pretty much all of the water. I then do one last water washing of the beaker, and this also serves to wash the product a final time. Using a glass stir rod, I mix everything in the filter flask thoroughly to make sure that it's all washed. I then clean the sides using a wash bottle and I pull a vacuum on the product to dry it up as much as possible. After a few minutes, it's not completely dry but we're left with a semi-dry paste. I transfer the paste directly to a beaker and now we can start on the second reaction. Our goal in this portion of the reaction is to reduce that NO2 nitro group to an amine which is NH2. To do this there's several ways, but the most popular way is to use something called sodium dithionite. The first thing we need to do is dissolve our 3 nitrothal hydrazide in water, and to do this we must have a strongly basic solution. I made about 50 milliliters of 10% sodium hydroxide solution. The volume doesn't have to be super exact, so you can probably make this just by throwing in 5 grams of sodium hydroxide into about 45 mils of water. Once it's made and the solution is clear, we can add it to our 3 nitrothal hydrazide and you can see the solution immediately turns red and then nearly black. The solution is then stirred until everything has fully dissolved. The next step is to add our reducing agent, sodium dithionite. Our over-the-counter source for this is super iron out, but it's not a pure source. Sodium dithionite is also known as sodium hydrosulfite, and if we look at the MSDS for the super iron out, 
we see that it represents about 15 to 40% of the powder. Instead of doing experiments to find out how much sodium dithionate's in there, we can do some math to find out the minimum amount that must be present. If we assume everything else is the maximum amount advertised, we can subtract it all from 100 and find out the minimal amount of sodium dithionate that we could have is 33.5%. So if our powder is only 33.5% sodium dithionate, we just have to use three times as much. This is what we do, and I measured out 45 grams of the super iron out, and I start adding it. The moment we add some, the color will start to change, and it will eventually go from a very dark red to a yellow. It also becomes clearly opaque as there is some sort of precipitate falling out of solution, and this is actually our luminol product. To push the reaction to completion, we heat it to boiling for about 4-5 to five minutes. I'm not going to get into the details on exactly what the mechanism of the reaction is, but effectively, as you can see, we're converting this NO2 group to an NH2 group. This type of reaction is known as a reduction reaction, and I actually did a very similar one where I reduced nitrobenzene to aniline. For that reaction though, I didn't use sodium dithionite, and I think I used tin and hydrochloric acid. There are a lot of ways you can carry out a reduction reaction, and it really depends on what you're trying to reduce and what environment the reduction is taking place in. A very simple example would be this, where it had to be done under basic conditions, so we definitely couldn't use the tin hydrochloric acid method, because then that would be under acidic conditions. The next thing that I needed to do was neutralize the sodium hydroxide using glacial acetic acid. Luminol is actually soluble under basic conditions, so we need to neutralize the base to precipitate out as much product as possible. I actually added a lot of acetic acid, and it was a total of 25 milliliters. As more acetic acid was added, it started to foam a lot, and this became a problem. The foaming occurs because in the super iron out, there's sodium carbonate, and when this reacts with the acetic acid, it produces CO2 gas. Eventually the foaming became a problem, so I had to transfer it to a larger beaker. I washed the other beaker with a little bit of water to get out as much luminol as possible. I then continued to add the rest of the glacial acetic acid. I ended up adding all of my 25 mils of acetic acid, but you might have to add more or less depending on how you set things up. Using my universal pH papers, I test the pH, and you can see that it's hovering around neutral. We're looking for neutrality, and we don't want it to be heavily acidic. At this point, the reaction is done, our product is separated, and it's time to filter it off. So again, just like you've seen in a million videos, I vacuum filter it. When there's just a small paste left at the bottom, I use a little bit of water to wash the sides. Then using a glass stir rod, I mix it up to make sure that I wash the luminol as much as possible. I transferred it to a beaker and mix it around with a little bit of 95% ethanol. I brought the contents to a boil and I started adding more hot ethanol. I kept doing this to an arbitrary point where it looked like most had dissolved. I let the contents of the beaker settle and then I decanted it into a larger beaker. It's important not to include the stuff at the bottom because in super iron out, they add a little bit of sand or something to it. At the bottom of the beaker, you can see all of the sand and gritty stuff that I've left behind. The hot ethanol solution is allowed to cool to room temperature, and then it's placed in a freezer. At the bottom, we have our much cleaner luminol. We then use another vacuum filter, and we separate the luminol. We simply vacuum off the ethanol, and I wash the beaker a few times to get all of the product out. After it's all vacuumed through, the luminol is washed with a little bit of more fresh ethanol. The luminol is then dried of ethanol by keeping the vacuum on for several minutes. Our final luminol product is transferred to a watch glass, and this is what we get. The final yield was about 0.5 grams of luminol, which is extremely low. I'm not exactly sure why the yield is so low, but it doesn't really matter to me because a small amount of luminol goes a long way. 0.5 grams is more than enough for me to do everything I want to do with it. So now it's time to test out the luminol that we made, and I start off by adding about 500 milliliters of water to a large Erlenmeyer flask. There's actually a lot of luminol solution recipes that you can choose from, 
and this just happens to be the one that I went with. Almost all of the recipes use two solutions, where one is the luminol solution, and the other one contains an oxidizer and a catalyst. To start things off, I add in 4 grams of sodium carbonate. This was actually made from sodium bicarbonate in a previous video of mine. I then turn on the stirring plate, and I have the stir bar mix the sodium carbonate until it's fully dissolved. Once we have a clear solution, I add in 0.2 grams of the luminol that we just made. Luminol is not very soluble in regular water, but when a base is present, its solubility increases a lot. To dissolve all of the luminol, it's going to take several minutes of stirring, so it takes a little bit of patience. 25 grams of sodium bicarbonate. This 25 grams of sodium bicarbonate is added to act as a buffer. This helps keep the luminol solution at a constant pH when we react it later on. Once it's cleared up a little bit, I pour in 0.2 grams of ammonium carbonate. I stir it for a little while until it looks like everything's dissolved, and then I top it off to about 1 liter with distilled water. Once it's topped off to a liter, I let it stir for a little bit, but at this point, we finished making our luminol solution. We can set this aside and move on to making our second solution. So to make our second solution, I start with 30.4 grams of potassium ferrous cyanide. The ferrous cyanide is going to act as our iron catalyst. Our powder is then dissolved by adding in 1 liter of 3% hydrogen peroxide. I should also note that despite it containing cyanide, the potassium ferrous cyanide on its own is pretty inert. As long as it's not heated up and decomposed to potassium cyanide or mixed with acid to produce hydrogen cyanide, it's pretty safe. Once the 1 liter of the 3% peroxide is added, we just stir it up to fully dissolve everything. After just a few minutes of stirring, we're left with a fairly clear but slightly bubbly solution. The bubbles are actually oxygen gas, which comes from the hydrogen peroxide breaking down into oxygen and water. Anyway, once we're done, we're left with two clear solutions, the slightly yellow luminol one on the left, and the orangey ferrous cyanide one on the right. Now it's time to test out the luminol, and to do this, we pour out equal volumes of each of the solutions. I pre-adjust the camera so it's more sensitive in the dark, and then I turn off the lights. Then, when the two solutions are mixed, you can see that they immediately start to glow. The initial glow is pretty bright, but it immediately dies down a little bit. The recipe that I use, though, will maintain a steady glow like this for something like 50 seconds. This recipe results in a long, steady glow, but some other recipes result in a very short, bright glowing. It's actually a lot brighter in person, it's just really hard for the camera to pick up low light. Just as another test, I soaked some paper towel in the ferrous cyanide solution, and then I sprayed some luminol onto it. Spraying luminol like this is actually commonly used to detect blood. To detect blood, however, our luminol solution would have to be a little bit different and include the oxidizer in it. So here when we spray the luminol, the iron in the ferrous cyanide is catalyzing the reaction, but if we were to spray it onto blood, the iron in the blood would catalyze it. Unfortunately, the amount of light produced here is really low, so I really had to push my camera to pick it up. But that being said though, that's all I really have to say about luminol. In the future, I do plan to make a video on how it can be used forensically to detect blood, but I'm not exactly sure when I'll make that. The next video that I'm going to post after this is making benzaldehyde from toluene using chromal chloride. In the meantime, before I release my next video, you can check out my new channel that I made, which is very creatively called Nile Blue. This channel is going to be more focused on general science, so you'll see videos here like the one I posted on why water puts out fire. Right now I only have one video, and it explores the pseudoscience of alkaline water and an alkaline diet. I'll provide a link below in the description if you want to check it out. Anyway, that's all I really have to say for now, and I'll see you guys on the next one.